If you wanted to press record, Teresa, also, just to remind you. Wait another minute, and then we'll get going. Okay, it's a little bit after seven, so um, I guess we'll start. Uh, hello, my name is Rob Caldwell and I'm with the New Market Public Library. Um, thank you for attending this evening's special guest author event with Desmond Cole. The library is proud to once again partner with the New Market African Caribbean Canadian Association for Black History Month this year on today's event, as well as the successful panel discussion earlier in the month. Uh, your audio and video are turned off, but you will be able to ask questions and participate using the text chat feature in Zoom. I'll now introduce Teresa Grant Hall, who will present the land acknowledgement, and then we'll introduce the speaker and moderator. Uh, Teresa is an innovative and strategic thinker who is committed to moving our communities forward through partnerships and cooperation. Teresa holds a master's degree from New York University and has developed specialized knowledge in the principles of race relations, equity, diversity and inclusion. She is the founder and chair of the New Market African Caribbean Canadian Association, also known as NACA, which is a registered nonprofit organization that is focused on building and connecting communities, supporting and strengthening black families and businesses and empowering black youth. Teresa is chair of the Town of Newmarket Anti-Black Racism Task Force and was a member of the steering committee, as well as the working group to work closely to develop the anti-black racism strategy for the York Region District School Board. Teresa is deeply committed to building community and building relationships. She is a dedicated leader driven by the desire to eradicate racial discrimination by cultivating and promoting an inclusive environment where social harmony, mutual respect, and human dignity are realized for all. Teresa. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. And thank you to the New Market Public Library and the Town of New Market for partnering, partnering with us once again to bring this event to you. Welcome everyone. A special welcome to a few of our dignitaries who will be listening in. MP P. Elliott, MP Van Bynen, Mayor John Taylor and members of council, Chief Max Sween and members of the York Regional Police Department and our directors for the York Catholic Board and the York Public School Board. Louise Ceresco from the York Region Public School Board and the Interim Director from the York Catholic District School Board, Mary Batista, and others who are joining. A special welcome to all uh, our community members and those attending today's event. I'd like to start off by acknowledging uh, those, those pro-activists and activists that came before us, I'd like to call on a few names um, to acknowledge that we didn't get here in this place on our own. We, get he we got here in into this place by the work um, and the endurance of these stalwarts like M Nelson Mandela, Marcus Garvey, Bob Marley, Viola Desmond, Rosemary Brown, Kodan Naleye, and my mother, Iris Malcolm. So I want to acknowledge and honor those who've come before us and upon whose shoulders we stand. Before we begin, I want to acknowledge that the land on which we gather is the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, and Wendat peoples. I also acknowledge that we convene this meeting upon the treaty lands of the First Nations of the Williams Treaty and the Chippewas of Georgina Island First Nations as our closest community. We also acknowledge that we are all treaty peoples, including those who came here as settlers, as immigrants, either in this generation or in generations past, 
and who came here involuntarily, primarily as a result of the transatlantic slave trade. We must also recognize the fact that this colonial nation is founded in historic and ongoing dispossession of this land's indigenous peoples and African descendant peoples. Today, we especially pay tribute to the ancestors of those of African and indigenous origin and descent. As an organization that centers on social justice, we feel it is critical to be informed on the past and the ongoing consequences of colonialism. We encourage everyone to learn about the history of these lands and to support resistance here and across Turtle Island. I give thanks for the land that nourishes us and enables us to live in communities. May we continue to aspire to nurture and care for this land and for each other. Thank you and over to you, Rob. Thank you. Um, our moderator this evening is Michael Bowe. Michael Bowe was born in the Bahamas and subsequently raised in Jamaica during his formative years. He has over 22 years of experience as a respected equity and community engagement specialist and advocate. Uh, Mr. Bowe has a master's degree in social work from New York University and has worked in the field of child welfare for over 20 years. As a former employee of the Children's Aid Society of Toronto, he founded Soulful Journey, which is a series of excursions that offer, offer participants such as children and youth in care, foster parents and staff an awe-inspiring view of the African-Canadian experience. Michael works to engage diverse communities, organizations, and service recipients and residents towards collaborative work and mutual responsibility for the well-being of children, families, and their communities in a manner that embraces equity and anti-oppressive principles. He has developed and delivered training programs focused on unconscious bias, anti-Black racism, anti-oppressive practice, decolonization, and other forms of isms and equity frameworks. And our main speaker this evening is Desmond Cole. Mr. Cole is a journalist, activist, and author. He has spent the last 10 years reporting and commentating on politics and social justice. He is especially interested in the struggle for Black liberation within Canada. His work includes 10 years of local and national news coverage, five years of radio broadcasting at News Talk 1010, a disruptive opinion column with the Toronto Star, and an award-winning magazine feature. His first book is the number one national bestseller, Skin We're In, A Year of Black Resistance and Power. Welcome, Mr. Bo and Mr. Cole. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, so uh, Desmond, I've been uh, looking forward to this like um, for months, basically since uh, I was invited by Jerisa to uh, moderate and this event as well as interview you. And um, I noted off the top that I bought my son uh, a book and I have uh, my book here. It's all marked up and so forth. I'll probably buy another one just to have it on the shelf to preserve it because it's such an incredible uh, lit literary um, piece of work. Yes. I mean, it, it's so layered and textured with um, history beyond 2016 that it represents. It brings in uh, legacies from the past and how they inform our present and really takes us forward in terms of uh, where we need to be. And I do wanna have some conversations with you about what liberation might look like and how we might get there, as well as talk about how people like me, being a senior leader of equity in uh, the child welfare sector is implicated in those sectors. And can you truly decolonize an uh, institution that was born out of colonization and set up to uh, center whiteness and white supremacy? So these are things that I struggle with in child welfare and those who are equity leads uh, within that particular sector. But of course it impacts all sectors. So it's, a, it's just a true delight uh, sitting here with you and everyone else. And really, I was gonna say break bread, but there's nothing to eat, but at least uh, have a conversation. So thank you for being with us, Desmond. Thank you, thank you. That's so kind of you, Michael. And I wanna thank Teresa as well for that really lovely opening and land acknowledgement and uh, for mentioning among other people, uh, our late sister, Hora Nalaye after whom a school is now going to be named. And I hope that one day in the future, we're 
naming and remembering Black people in this moment who have been fighting so hard um, to make that a reality. And so, uh, you know, rest in peace to our sister. Thank you to all the people in that region who have been fighting for her and fighting to make that, um, that school naming and that honoring a reality. It's like really, really powerful. And I'm so honored, uh, Teresa, that you started there today. So thank you. And thank you to NACA for making this evening possible. And uh, thanks for that, uh, Desmond. I will convey what you said to the family. I'm actually uh, uh, Hoden's um, brother-in-law and uh, the family, although uh, they remained um, out, out of the, the struggle because really we don't want to soil Hoden's name and we want to be respectful of the process. And, uh, and the respectful of the women who are leading this fight. Because uh, oftentimes we don't respect and highlight and put on, ho on high uh, black women who have led the struggle, especially black trans women. And we'll get to that because you've written so beautifully about um, how they are centered, black, queer and trans people centered in our struggle and uh, that we tend to overlook them. But I, I will, send that on to the family and they're quite humbled that uh, the communities is, you know, um, have recommended her name and is fighting on behalf um, of uh, what they think is right and, and what represents community voice. So Desmond, oh man, I, I don't know where to start. It's just 13 riveting chapters of just incredible, as I mentioned, layered history. So it's a tap tapestry of of um, our lives in 2016, particularly black lives and what we've been through and the stuff that I read about uh, that you've written about really framed 2016 uh, for me and prior to that. You, Sorry. You, you did set that up beautifully um, in terms of um, setting up 2016 and informing it with prior years. But I really wanna start with um, where you were born and where you grew up and uh, the context of that in terms of uh, your Sierra Leone background. Uh, you had mentioned that you were born on the flatlands of uh, Red Deer, Alberta, but of course uh, your, your parents and your, your lineage extends back to Sierra Leone. And uh, then you, you left Alberta and went to um, Oshawa. And I do wanna get to your experience in grade one because I think it frames our experience as a community growing up and being young and when we start to learn about race. So could you talk to us a little bit about uh, your upbringing in the flatlands of uh, Red Deer? I don't remember a whole lot about Red Deer, Alberta. I was about five and a half when we left, but um, you know, I think what I remember is even at a very young age, you may not understand what race is. But when you live in a place like Red Deer in the late 1970s and early 80s, you can't not be aware of your race as a black person living in that very, very white space. So you might not have the words and the language for it, and I definitely did not. But you notice it, you know, I mentioned in the book that um, the woman who provided me childcare, who's like one of the people I remember the most from my childhood was a white woman uh, in our neighborhood who used to take care of me. And everybody in Red Deer was white except for us. Uh, and so it felt noticeable to me as a child, but I didn't know how to talk about it. Um, my parents certainly can tell you that they had, they can speak a lot more about their experiences, right? They were grown and um, my mom was working in retail and uh, both my parents were doing the kind of like low level customer service jobs that you associate with black immigration to Canada, um, low wage, no big salary or benefits or protections, no real job security. And um, like a lot of people that I know in the late late 80s, my parents moved out to Ontario thinking, you know, economically maybe we'll have a better prospect out there and the, the, the cycles 
the upswings and the downswings of Alberta, they made a lot of people move at certain times and a lot of people moved out of Alberta during that time, including us. And um, we ended up in Oshawa, which is another really white uh, place, uh, you know, mainly white working class kind of place. And um, as I grew up, you know, getting a little older, you just become more and more and more conscious of race all the time. Mm. So that story that I share in the book about coloring with my friends and one of them asking for the skin pencil crayon, right? And there's just like this awakening because you recognize that when these white kids are saying the skin color pencil print crayon, pass that one, pass that one, they're not talking about your skin color and they're not even aware that they're not talking about your skin color right in front of you. So it was just a moment that I remember. And as you get older, you have more of those. But I think all of us as black Canadians, um, if we grow up in particularly white spaces, we have these experiences. And all of us as Black people in the white spaces that we have to occupy, whether we grew up in them or not, are familiar with what I'm talking about here. You know, you just become more and more conscious of it, though, the older that you get. So true, so true. And I, I really related to that story because I remember um, being around the same age in grade one as well, when I really became conscious that there wasn't a skin color for me and that I had to use the brown that was dedicated to coloring the tr tree bark, as you mentioned, the wood uh, trees uh, for my skin color. And that's when I began to realize that there's a difference here. So you, that really centers whiteness um, in your book and white supremacy and how it begins to frame uh, young black kids really early in life. And it, it, as you mentioned, it travels with you. So let's fast forward to John Samuels and what happened uh, on New Year's Eve, uh, having rented that space for just 10 months and uh, the debacle over the, the, uh, the liquor license and what took place and what, what was lost during uh, that time and how it also framed how police engage the black community. Because I think you did a wonderful job in, with that story wrapping around the larger story of us all. So this is the story of a young man, John Samuels, who, um, you know, he, he told me that he really always wanted to have his own physical space somewhere in the city as a young artist who was doing visual art, who had dance shows and was a really accomplished dancer, who had a crew of dancers with him. They, they you know, they really came up together wanting to have their own place to rehearse, to have shows. And they didn't have that, but it was a big dream. And he told me that um, he mentored under somebody for a while and then he thought, you know what? He was about 22 and he said, I think I'm ready to do this. Like I, I'm ready to get my own space and start running an art space in the city of Toronto. And then I want it to be for other black folks like myself. So he was, uh, able to actually get a space that was up to be demolished uh, and he got a short-term lease in it and so he's living his dream. He has this space uh, in the kind of high park area on a main street. He's got a storefront and he starts doing his thing. He starts doing art shows, he starts doing dance shows, poetry readings and um, inviting other people to come and curate and do things in his gallery. But he says that you know, there's always negative attention from people in the neighborhood. And after long, uh, the cops start showing up unannounced all the time and uh, criminalizing him, searching his place, asking him a whole bunch of questions without any cause, mm -hmm. just treating black people the way that the police are trained and have historically treated us. Um, what this leads to is a raid of John's art gallery on New Year's Eve. Um, I don't want to tell the whole chapter, so I'll say no. that um, all of this attention against John and this surveillance culminates in the police 
coming to his, uh, uh, um, his art gallery on New Year's Eve, telling all of his guests in the uh, space who are having a party that they have to leave and go home, attacking John and assaulting him. And of course, because John is, you know, I'm gonna guess a buck 40 soaking wet. It's not a big person, not that it ever matters, but he is charged with assaulting like the, you know, 20 officers, one of the like 20 officers who came to raid the art gallery, smash the window. This was all caught on tape as well by multiple of his friends. Right. Um, John's experience really makes me think about what I call that chapter, which is Negro frolics. Mm -hmm. It makes me think about how 300 plus years ago, sorry, 200 plus years ago, something like 240 years ago in what is now Nova Scotia, there was a law made against the first uh, black people to kind of permanently settle in that area, the black loyalists. There was a law made against black people drinking in public, dancing in public. You can't do anything having in public, public. you can't congregate. We don't wanna have too many black people in the same space. This is 240 years ago. Mm. But what's, what's different about what happened to John with his friends? And you know, I'll, I'll encourage people who haven't read the book to read it the white psyche teaches people to think of a reason why such a police response would be justified. It doesn't assume that John and his friends aren't doing anything on New Year's Eve. It assumes that there must be a reason why the police came and raided their party, smashed the windows and arrested John. It presumes black guilt instead of the system that tells us we are innocent until proven guilty. We all know that the whole reason that a young man is receiving all of this attention from the police the second he moves into the neighborhood is particularly because he's black and that people around him who are white and surveilling him are afraid of his presence. So we just see this over and over and over and I called the chapter Negro Frolics because the name of the law forbidding black people from drinking, partying, dancing in public, gambling in the 1780s in modern day Nova Scotia, that law was entitled um, a law pro prohibiting Negro frolics. And I think that we should be honest with ourselves in the 21st century and say that when this is happening to our children, and we're seeing these things on the news, nothing really has changed in that regard. There's no new reason why this is happening to black people. It's the same reason as it's always been. And that's what I found is the centerpiece of the book is connecting it once more the past with the present to show that this isn't new. This has been happening for eons. It just might take on a different form, but it's still here with us. And I love the way you, you did that connection to the past, from the past to the present. Now, you start to frame out what, white supremacy and you did a really good job in providing a fresh look at it from a different angle. And I'm just gonna uh, read something from page nine because I think you did a really good job in in uh, introducing it and framing it. So you have your whiteness is an impeachable rubber that deflects collective human failing. Nothing sticks to whiteness. Blackness is the glue and every negative thing that gets hurdled at it sticks. A more concise version of the rhyme was the always popular quote, I know you are, but what am I? The modern incarn incarnation of whiteness resists exposure and definition. White supremacy thrives in large part by avoiding being named or identified. When confronted with its own violence, whiteness simply flips the script. I know you are, but what am I? Whiteness can rhyme off the sins of blackness, even as it resists any collective agency or responsibility for itself. So long as the spectrum of blackness looms largest, whatever whiteness is doing cannot be so bad, or at least can't be worth mentioning. And I love the way you connect whiteness uh, with the idea of that little rhyme that we all know. I know you, but what am I? Could you uh, delve into that a bit further in terms of what that means? 
I, I think for me, um, TV Black is the way that I've heard it described often that I think is really helpful is that it's about being hyper visible and invisible at the same time. Or to put it another way, Chris Rock has a line in one of his standups where he says, um, the funny thing about being black in a white man's territory is that there will always be either an overreaction or an underreaction to every single thing that you do. And I, I've never actually heard it described more concisely than that. I, I, I feel like things that we have to consider at Black people because of the white gaze, G-A-Z-E, -G right? The things that we are always wondering about or fearing, it is um, a form of like hyper surveillance and hyper awareness, hyper um, vigilance all the time. And that it is also uh, in many ways not being seen so when we talk about uh, women going missing, black trans women are particularly vulnerable to acts of violence, to being disappeared and to being murdered. And yet at the same time, there's almost no conversation socially about that disappearance of black trans women compared to so many other groups of people. So it's about being hyper visible and invisible at the same time. Whereas whiteness just isn't to be mentioned. It's not to be spoken about. It's rude to bring up whiteness. White people get offended when you say you're a white person. Oh, how dare you? How dare you point me out and suggest that I am nothing more than this hue of my skin or the color of my eyes? They say, how dare you? But they don't understand that we don't get to live in a world where we can pretend that we are not this. White Canadian society insists on reminding us at all times that this is who we are. And I, um, I say that to say that um, it is not that I am ashamed of being black, far from it. Mm. But um, I don't want every aspect of my life to be predetermined by my racial background. And, Unfortunately, in this country, that is the case. We know from people's racial background on average how easily or hard it's gonna be for them to get a job, how more likely they are to be kicked out of school or suspended from school, how much more likely they are to be apprehended on the child welfare system. All of these things can be predicted in Canada by race, literally, like this is the reality. Who's going to get stopped more by the police? Who's gonna get charged more by the police? When they get charged, Who's going to get a more harsh sentence for the same crime? All of these things are stratified by race in Canada. And Black people are not at the top on the favorable end of any of these metrics. We are always at the bottom. And so um, I, I see somebody uh, making a comment here about the invisible backpack. And, and certainly, right, that's, that's one of the ways that I was first introduced into this idea as well, is that when white colonial powers took this land, created an Indian act and said whiteness is the norm now. They created a society where talking about things as whiteness is just talking about the norm. Everyone who's not white deviates from the norm and what's white changes over time. So people who came here from Eastern Europe a couple of generations ago will tell you that as an Italian person, as an Irish person, as a Polish person, they were not white in previous generations, but that has actually changed. The definition of whiteness is changing, but it never includes us. It's not going to include us. It is actually designed to exclude us because we are the cheap labor in whiteness and white supremacy's <laughs> capitalist hierarchy. We're the mule. We're the scapegoat. We're the cheap disposable labor. And that's what happened on the sugar plantations of Haiti. Hmm. And that's what happened in the Americas uh, from top to bottom with black people being carted and sold like animals, tossed into the seas in order to justify their white domination, white settlers and white colonists created this 
philosophy of superiority that is still with us today. And so when I say that, you know, I am rubber, you are glue, it bounces off me and it sticks to you. That's what I mean. Whiteness is always trying to deny its own presence and existence, but it's always saying, do you notice this about black people? Don't you notice that about black people? Hey, somebody moved in over or across the street and he's black. Like it, whiteness is obsessed with calling out our blackness, but it doesn't want to be named. It doesn't want to be identified itself for being white. And that is, um, you know, it's a really frustrating thing to try and overcome because how do you address something in your country that the majority of people who live in your country want to be in denial about, don't want to address because it makes them feel bad because they personalize it and say, you're saying I'm racist. You're saying I am a white supremacist. No, that's actually not what we're saying. We're saying you live in a white supremacist country and context and you have a history. That's what we're saying. We're not saying you personally, but it's very hard when people are in constant denial when they're saying, I know you are this, but what am I? It's very hard to start addressing the impact of white supremacy and the, the destruction that it causes. Because some people are benefiting from that destruction while they keep us at the lower end of that hierarchy. And this is only chapter one, January <laughs> 2016. I mean, this book is so dense with information and with analysis and with just taking a critical lens as to each month that we lived in 2016. And of course, again, with some setup information prior to. So Nick Sorry, Michael, it's, it's 2017 actually. Sorry, 2017, yes. So moving from that to chapter two, and I'll skip some chapters because we don't have enough time to really go through all of them. Zero tolerance. And many of us would be, hopefully would be familiar with uh, the story of uh, that young six-year-old girl. And as you mentioned, she, she was only 48 pounds and she was shackled by two big police officers um, within uh, the Peel, Pub Peel District Public School Board. And that just terrifying uh, experience that she went through, that we went through uh, when it was for, first brought to uh, public awareness. And in the book, you call her Simone just to protect her identity. What came out of that in terms of how the police operate in that regard? We talked about John Samuels and what happened there and you really set up our longstanding, um, you know, back and forth struggle with the police and oppression that evolves from that. Now you're looking at a six year old girl that has been shackled by two police officers and how the police responded and how they failed to get other institutions involved. And why is that? Yeah, um, this story is so difficult. But for me, um, this story and that chapter, Zero Tolerance, is about what you were mentioning earlier, Michael. It's, a, it's about Black women in our community who are taking the lead in fighting for their children's education and who are encountering all kinds of obstacles in tr just trying to seek basic safety for their children at school. Um, black mothers, black women fighting so hard against these huge structures mm. that are not designed for them or for their kids. And um, so the, it's, it's the mom of the child I call Simone. Um, it's her mom whose name I also protect um, who really leads this fight after finding out what has happened to her daughter mm. and whose courage in speaking out about what has happened to her daughter mm. forces the police to open an investment because they don't immediately open an investigation when this happens. They wait months until she goes public with it. I call mom Brenda in the book. Um, that's not her name, but Brenda goes public with this and um, you know, her steadfastness and her resolve to get justice leads her to the Human Rights Tribunal. And this goes beyond my telling in the book because it was only um, late last year, if I remember correctly now, 
that the Human Rights Tribunal, four years plus after this incident occurred, awarded the child $35,000 in damages and acknowledged that her race was a factor in the way that the police treated her when they shackled her and held her face down on the floor for half an hour. Now we in the black community all knew that race was a factor. No one needed a human rights tribunal to tell us that. I think the bigger issue is, Michael, I can't tell you the names of the two police officers who came into an elementary school and did that to a child. I can't tell you their names because their names were never released. I can't tell you about any internal discipline that they may have faced for doing that because the police don't release that kind of information. I can't tell you what they did before they shackled a six-year-old girl in her classroom or what they've done since. And this is in a uh, region in Peel where police officers have taken the lives of Black people in the last year, including Jamal Francis, DeAndre Campbell. Police took the life of Ijaz Chowdhury in 2020. You know, police shot Chantal Krupka in 2020 or in 2019. I mean... This is a board that is responsible for an overwhelming amount of violence. The murder of Mark Akamba Boekwa a few years ago, Jermaine mm -hmm. Carby shot in his car or just outside of a car in Peel region. Like this is one region of the greater Toronto area. It's not even the region that most people associate with the GTA, which is Toronto proper. And this is the level of violence that the police are engaging in on a regular. So why are we not allowed to know sorry so they like my questions are like why are we not allowed to know the disciplinary records of police why do we live in a society where asking for that falls so flat as if people are not interested in it for god's sake michael there's a case in kawartha lakes right now i can't believe i'm about to utter these words but there's a case of opp officers having shot an infant, a one-year-old child hmm. that just happened, you know, four months ago, we've been hearing the news that a baby was shot while there was some kind of a police chase. Police and the SIU has recently, as of last week, I believe, determined that one of the officers shot into a car and fatally wounded a one-year-old infant. I can tell you that, Michael, but I can't tell you the name of that officer because they haven't been charged yet. The SIU's investigation is still ongoing, even though they know that one of these officers shot a child. And I think we really need to grapple with what it means, that there's no sense of urgency about that and there's no panic. But when a man is choked to death in the United States, we are all in arms and everyone needs to talk about racism and everyone is more aware of anything that they've ever been. But when it's happening in your backyard, where are you and where is the concern and where is the urgency? Why don't you know the names of the people that I even just mentioned? This is really where my work begins is that mom fighting for her child isn't getting the kind of support that you would imagine is out there when you've been hearing people in institution talk for the last six or eight months. Everyone is an anti-racist now. Everybody is about equity, diversity, and inclusion now. But our children are being taken in these streets and you wouldn't know it. And I, I think there's something deeply wrong with that. But you know that chapter was a tribute to Black women like Simone's mom and to um, you know, people in our region and in this country, like, um, you know, like uh, uh, Charlene Grant, who is the other person that I feature in that story. And some of you will know Charlene Grant because uh, of the connections to York and her struggle, you know, when she was just trying to deal with an issue of racism in her school and her struggle with Nancy Elgie. So that book, that chapter is a tribute to women who are fighting back and who, who are just caught in these situations while the majority of our society either watches or puts the blame back on black mothers as being black bad parents, as being responsible for the police's violence against them, against the, the school's violence. 
you know, there's a lot there, I could, you know, I, there's so much we could talk about, but you know, that that's really what I think about is that some of us have to bear such a huge responsibility for these issues because others of us are refusing to see them and acknowledge them. And I appreciate you really taking the time to go into that because it speaks to, and you, you quoted uh, some stats from the Toronto District School Board in that you said, black students only make up 13% of the population, the student population, but represents 48% of suspension. And when it comes to white youth, it's 10% that are suspended only. And when you uh, speak of child welfare and justice and you bring in those numbers around disproportionality and of course disparity in terms of how we're treated in comparison to um, white youth, children, families, and the communities that they're part of. It's really sh shocking. It's, it's shocking, but it's not. But it's, it, it just really shows you the, the pattern and the themes that thread throughout all the institutions in terms of how we're disproportionately represented and the disparity in treatment when, it, when you compare us to our white counterparts. Now, you'd mentioned uh, uh, Nancy Eldry and of course, uh, she using the N-word and another person from the board hearing it. Uh, Charlene didn't hear it and actually uh, making Charlene aware. And of course it came to the fore and another struggle had to go on in order to uh, make that wrong, to at least address the wrong. Mm -hmm. And you, you brought up a term, white supremacy improv. Could you explain what that is? White supremacist improv is something that again, I think we all know as black people what this is. And it's when you hear a story like the story involving Charlene, where a white woman, Nancy LG, who isn't worried about who's listening, refers to Charlene Grant as the N-word. And she does this at the end of a York Region District School Board uh, uh, board meeting that was to address equity issues. You know, and she she says this word, and her colleagues hear her saying this word, directing it at a black woman, at Charlene Grant. And what you get after that is that the Toronto Star gets a hold of this information and publicizes it for the first time in late 2016. And Nancy LG is very defensive, and she doesn't want to come out and categorically deny that she said that word. So she's not like, oh, I've never said that. I didn't say that. She's using kind of evasive language to not answer whether she said it or not. And what you get is you get all of these white sympathizers in very powerful, influential places in our media who start creating an imaginary story of why a white woman would say this to a black woman, even though it's not what happened. They start fantasizing, well, what if the reason she said it was this? What if the reason was that? I heard that Nancy LG fell and bumped her head a couple of weeks before she said this. So what if the reason she called Charlene the N-word is because she had recently fallen and hit her head and people legitimately said these things and tried to pass them off. This is exactly like when Rob Ford was uh, exposed as having used the N-word and many other horrific racial slurs. And people said, well, he was drunk and high. I don't use those words when I'm drunk and high, so I don't get it, but like this was an excuse. And this formulating this immediate defensive thing that white folks are taught to do when they hear about racism and they're immediately taught to imagine an explanation that comforts them instead of being like, well, what happened? That's white supremacist improv. And I say in the book, you don't have to be a white supremacist to play white supremacist improv. You don't even have to be white because we definitely know in our own communities that the power of white supremacy means that we as black people are often so hard on other black people and say, it's not even the government's fault. It's not the police's fault. It's black people's fault for not getting our act together. There are black people among us who will say that. And for me, that is, that is white supremacy speaking. That is a culture that has told us as black people that there's something uniquely wrong with us and undermining our self-esteem, undermining our confidence and making us maybe even believe 
that we have to be harder on ourselves in order to succeed in this white dominated society. So that's what white supremacist improv is. Thank you. Thank you for that. I've never uh, heard that before and it really framed what you just said, what we all know in community, but often uh, it's denied that it's happening when it does happen. So I'm gonna skip over March because that was a um, an action packed uh, chapter as they all are and folks need to read it uh, in terms of Abdi Rahman Abdi and what he went through in Ottawa. And uh, you tagged on a number of different things that went on with Vincent Gardner, for example, and the SIU. Um, and you really frame the history of the SIU in that chapter. You, you just have to read it to see what's going on there and the severe lacking. Uh, and you mentioned it in terms of not being able to know who these officers are and so forth, unless they are actually convicted, which is very rare, very, very rare. You, you mentioned Stacey Bonds in, in that particular chapter. And uh, it, it's just so many different uh, stories in there that broadens our understanding in terms of systemic, how things happen systemically and structurally. It's not just limited to their stories. But I do wanna to get to, um, and that was March. I do wanna to get to April, direct action, and why you left the Toronto Star when they accused you of um, public protests, engaging in public protest, because it really speaks to people like me to come back to folks who hold uh, senior leadership or equity lead roles within institutions, trying to fix it from inside, from within inside it, quote unquote, reimagine, reform, trim around the edges. Uh, is that even possible? And I know, I, I know your reflections on it, on it, but I really want, I'm sure there's other people that do my work in institutions need to know, or do we just need to abolish or dismantle and reimagine? And I know abolish meant, means different things to different people. So if you could talk to us about Toronto Star and why you left, what was surrounding that and whether you could do uh, this sort of work from the inside. Yeah, it's the classic question that we hear a lot. So I, I, want, I want to get to the inside outside question in a moment, but first, just in terms of what happened with me in the Toronto Star, very briefly, um, what happened was that I was asked to be a columnist there. There was a very big deal made about my arrival there in 2015. And within a month, uh, not even a year of my being there, I was being kind of summoned into this meeting by the leadership of the Toronto Star and being told, you know, tone it down with the race stuff, tone it down. You're doing too much of this race stuff. Your audience wants to hear other things. And I was like, my audience, don't, don't they wanna hear what I'm saying since they're my audience? Like, how does my audience, how are you telling me what my audience are? It was very strange. And um, I went another year working at the publication, uh, you know, very freelance part-time basis, no tenure, no union no salary, no benefits, no sick time. And um, after another year, yeah, I engaged in a public demonstration in 2017. And the Toronto Star called me into their offices and said, by, by engaging in a public demonstration, you have violated the rules of the Toronto Star. I found this fascinating because as you can see in the book, I can name you a lot of other journalists who openly engage in political demonstration as we are told is their right to do as Canadians and they are not treated the way that I was treated. But that's what happened to me. And so when I was told that I, you have to pick, you have to either be an activist out here or you can be a journalist, but you can't do both of those things. I decided to pick activism and leave the Toronto Star. And um, I, I frame that story in the book around the history of police carding mm -hmm. in Toronto. And the reason that I did that is because the Toronto Star, despite the way that they treated me, are one of the big reasons that the issue of carding became a conversation in Toronto at all. They did incredible investigative journalism around the issue of police stopping people who are not suspected of any crime and surveilling them, taking their personal information for nothing, keeping it and creating like databases of just random stops 
arbitrary stops of black people. I should never, never say random stops because they are not random. They don't fi randomly find black people. It's the opposite of random. You couldn't do this randomly and land on as many black people as you do, right? But um, I have to give it up to the Toronto Star for the work that they did to uncover carding. The only problem was when they signed on a black columnist who was going to start writing opinions about things like carding, then they were afraid then somebody who I guess was connected to the newspaper didn't like it. Maybe some of their sponsors didn't like it. Maybe their connections to the police didn't like it. And they began to try and come down on me. And uh, this leads to your question, Michael, about inside versus outside. Mm -hmm. And here's what I'll say about that in brief. I don't think inside versus outside is the right question. It's about what you're doing whether you're on the inside or the outside. I didn't have union protection when the Toronto Star came to me and said, you violated the rules. I didn't feel like I had violated the rules because I know other white people who work, Naomi Klein worked for the Toronto Star. When did anyone ever tell Naomi Klein, you can't engage in public action as a columnist at the Star because it will ruin your integrity as a columnist. No one ever said that to Naomi Klein, but they said that to me. I wasn't a member of the union, but the union that was having protections and did have a way to organize and fight back against that, they said nothing. They didn't even make a public statement to come out in support of me. I got a lot of people um, behind the scenes coming up to me and saying, Desmond, what's happening to you here is horrible. But there was no public action at the Toronto Stars Union among those who were actually protected. So that's my question, Michael, is if you're gonna be in the union, if you're on the inside, hmm but you're not going to use that position to push for black people who are being pushed out. What's the point? Gotcha. Whether you're inside or outside, it's actually about what you're engaging in. It's about what you're doing and not about where you find yourself. And I think that that's an important um, um, compliment to the chapter itself because people always tried to say, Desmond's not a journalist. He's an activist. And I'm like, but journalism is about what you do. It's not about what I believe. Journalism is about what I actually do and the work that I produce in the world. I am a journalist. I do the same thing that a lot of other journalists do. I also happen to fight for my Black life and the lives of other Black people. That doesn't negate my journalism. But obviously, when you live in a white supremacist and colonial state, it's going to see your journalism when it talks the way that mine does as being threatening. I relied really strongly on the work of Robin Maynard, who wrote the book Policing Black Lives, to write this chapter. Robin is so excellent, and her work is like indispensable in this country. Everyone should read the work of Robin Maynard, among others. But um, yeah, I don't think of it as inside versus outside, Michael. I think if you're in the highest echelons of government, are you fighting white supremacy or are you trying to find ways to go along to get along? We find that if you fight white supremacy real hard on the inside, often you get pushed out. That's a reality. But I don't think that that means that the solution is to go on the inside and as people think about it, like, you know, quietly work your way up if you have to be on the so-called inside and watch black, black people be harmed every day and you don't feel safe enough to say anything, I don't, I don't think that that's really an, an enviable position for us as black people. We, we want and need more than that. We have to be able to make noise even when we're on the inside. We have to make alliances and strategic partnerships even if we're on the inside because everybody needs to work in this capitalist society. Everybody needs to pay their bills. I understand that, believe me. But we need to get free. And all of us trying to become the prime minister or the cabinet minister or the high priced lawyer or the MD, I'm sorry, this society is capitalist. There isn't enough room for all of us black people even if we wanted to. It's not designed for all of us to be at the top. So ultimately we have to um, dismantle capitalism and white supremacy and create systems that actually protect and serve black people. You know, but you can do that from the inside if you want to. It just is risky and it requires a lot of different kinds of 
you know, sacrifices. I made a sacrifice when I left the Toronto Star, you know, but sometimes you have to do that. Wow. Well, I appreciate that. I, I really do. And I think a lot of folks on the line that are equity leads within their organization gives a lot of food for thought. Now we're, we're running out of time and I have to turn it over uh, to a moderation sort of format. Um, but I do want to just frame what else is in, in the book that people have to get this book to, to really begin to grapple and to interrogate and to question what they think they know about what happened in 2017 and what's happening now. So uh, this particular chapter, as you mentioned, you really look at uh, police surveillance and carding of the black community and you tether it back to the enslavement of black peoples. And you also look at how indigenous bodies are surveilled and carded and you tether that to colonial laws. It, it's a must read. It's a must read in terms of, again, how those legacies come and play out in different ways. And I like the way you connected to the uh, Summer of the Gun and how modern ways of uh, surveillance happen. And, and that was a seminal year. Uh, then you dropped us into a beautiful, uh, I don't know, it just came out of nowhere. Uh, <laughs> The Royal Botanical Gardens in Bur uh, Burlington and High Park, I won't say anymore. And then you move us through Black Lives Matter and why Black Lives Matter Toronto shut down the Pride Parade uh, just for 30 minutes in 2016. And that's such a riveting uh, story that folks need to understand it. You have to go beyond the media and what, what you're being told and why that happened. And of course it in involves Black, queer, and trans women, and 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 uh, I, I don't want to give too much, but you got to check that chapter out. Um, then, of course, you you looked at uh, uh, Canada One Fiftieth and how that went over in uh, 2017, which was a Tour de France in and of itself. And then I, I want to skip through. You you did the uh, you know the school. Um, uh, resource officers and so forth, which was huge. And that's still uh, something that we're grappling with. So that chapter needs to be read by everyone, but educators in particular and all the boards. I do wanna ask you though, before I turn it over to moderating a conversation with uh, the audience, given that uh, the issues around uh, Justice Donald McLeod has surfaced when it comes to the, uh, the Federation of Black Canadians, could you, um, if you can, encapsulate uh, a response uh, about what's happening there? Because I know it has created a bit of a rift within the community in terms of um, whether uh, you should have uh, talked out against them or not and so forth. And I just want to center that in terms of um, that conversation and then I'll turn it over to the, to the audience. Uh, well, thank you for asking the question, Michael. I, I do appreciate it. And I believe as Black people, this is one of those things that it may be deeply uncomfortable for some. It's deeply uncomfortable for me too. But I do ask us to grapple with it. Um, I was invited to the public launch, the public debut of the Federation of Black Canadians in 2017. I was invited to their summit with the Mikhail Jean Foundation. And I was very interested and intrigued by this group from the beginning. Um, there's so much that I can say, I know, I know. but let me try to just not be, I'll try to be somewhat brief here. I think that if people are organizing as black folks under a banner to serve their communities, that in principle, that is a wonderful and necessary thing. And I do a lot of that organizing myself. Uh, I don't usually do it under the banner of larger institutions. I, I usually work with individuals on an issue by issue basis for things that I have time for and that I feel passionately about, right? like many of us. So I have been um, accused many times 
of being jealous of other Black organizations and wanting to tear them down because I want to be the one to tell everybody how to do their activism. But there are thousands of Black groups in this country, and I've not spent nearly as much time on any of them as I have on the Federation of Black Canadians, because FBC made a different proposal than most other groups, and it presented itself in a far different way and had the ability and the resources to do so. That first summit had hundreds of people at it from all across the country, including myself. So obviously when you get invited to something like that and you look around, you're like, man, something really serious is going on here, but you wanna learn about it. You wanna learn what this group is going to do, what its mission is going to be, if it is going to be member driven, and um, again, without trying to get too much into all of the weeds, I feel as though the criticism of me, if I understand it and I want to represent it fairly, is that I didn't give this federation a chance to succeed or fail before I began quite harshly criticizing it. And I would reply by saying that we always want to afford Black people the benefit of the doubt when they organize and when they get together. And we always want to say that Black people who are getting together in our communities are pushing for good. And I have to be the bearer of bad news that sometimes Black people in our communities are not always doing things that we can stand behind or that I personally can stand behind. And that doesn't always mean that I have to say something. However, the reason I became entangled with the Federation of Black Canadians is because the Federation of Black Canadians from the beginning didn't want to advocate for a young man named Abdul Abdi, who in early 2018 was facing deportation. And you've read the book, Michael, so you know that that's the final chapter of my book. Yeah, yeah. chapter 13, yeah. People say that FBC was just trying to help Abdul and that for some reason, myself, Idil Abdullahi, L. Jones, and others who worked with his family directly, that we were somehow angry at FBC for wanting to help us. We asked everyone in our communities to help us, including FBC. But Michael, as hard as this might be for some people to hear tonight, I'm going to say it. And if you've been watching the hearing, you have full evidence as to what I am saying, because I'm not gonna say anything that hasn't already been said. FBC wanted to present to the public this idea that it was also going to help Abdul. Now there are dozens of groups and thousands of individuals across this country who helped Abdul, but none of them needed to find some new special way to do it. We were working with Abdul's family and his lawyer his family and lawyer crafted demands that we asked people to repeat. The most obvious demand was demand that Abdul's deportation order be stopped. The Federation of Black Canadians didn't want to do that. What they wanted to do was say, we're going to use our reach and our access to politicians to have closed door meetings about Abdul and that's how we're going to help. But when we, as Abdul's supporters, working directly with his lawyer and family, sent over things to FBC to say, this is how you can help us, they took that information, locked it up and put it in a box and never used it. While publicly saying we're helping Abdul, while publicly using Abdul's name to aggrandize their organization. I'm sorry. Abdul and Fatuma Abdi are real people. Some people think that this is just activists and organizers fighting over something, it isn't. These two people's numbers are in my cell phone. I have babysat their kids. I love Abdul and Fatuma. They are real human beings. Abdul was facing deportation and possible death. If you wanna help, you can help. But if you want to use this young man's name to say we're helping this individual while behind the scenes you're actually not doing that, I can't accept that. 
And may, people, people might ask, well, why would anyone do that? Why would anyone promise to help Abdul and not help him? You're just saying that, Desmond, that's not really what happened. Again, if you've been listening to the hearing, the evidence is all there and it's public. However, what I would say is when you're a judge with the Ontario court and Abdul's case is before a federal court, I do not think it is controversial to say you're probably the wrong person to be intervening in such an affair. And that's not about Donald McLeod being a good or bad person. It's about his role and his oath to the court of Ontario. I didn't ask him to sign that oath and swear that oath. He did that. But that necessarily means that maybe you're not the right person to be leading what you call an advocacy group. I did not ask Donald McLeod to go behind closed doors with politicians and make demands of them as somebody in the judiciary, which is against his role. He did those things. And one of his colleagues, a white woman named Faith Finistad wrote a complaint about him in 2018 saying, I've noticed that the justice is doing these things and they're not appropriate. Faith Finistad actually started writing to the ethics committee about Donald McLeod before the public knew that FBC was a thing. Unfortunately, Justice McLeod and many people who love him have decided to make this about me. I shouldn't have reported his misconduct. Is there a way for somebody who says they're leading a black organization to lie to their employer and not lie to the community? Is there a way to do that? Do we understand as black people when so folks represent themselves as one thing and then act as another? Are we supposed to accept that because they are black and influential? These are questions that I think that we need to ask ourselves because I think we all agree that no matter who you are, there's a line of conduct that you can cross that is unacceptable. Groups that register as a nonprofit organization, groups that ask the public for money, groups that say that they are going to represent all black people in Canada like the FBC, all we ask of them is transparency. I am a journalist. I wrote about my community. I did it for my own blog, which has no advertising and doesn't make me any money. And I have followed this story diligently for three years. People say that they want black entrepreneurship that they want black journalism. But when it is turned against somebody in our own community who may be doing things that are unacceptable, suddenly we do not want that. And we're very angry at journalists. I have to lay my work before people who would judge me and ask once again, if you're fighting for two young people, one of whom is facing deportation, is a group that says we're going to help and then as Justice McLeod testified today, yes, we took all of their information, but because I'm a judge, I didn't want to get in trouble. So I didn't do anything with that information. Well, then why are you leading an advocacy group? Why are you saying to the public as Justice McLeod did so many times, we're not going to apply for federal funding as the Federation because we're new on the scene, because there are established black organizations who deserve that money and who are out here fighting for it. We want to be independent of government. Justice McLeod has said that I don't know how many times, but then the group applied for federal funding and has been receiving it. I, I don't know how I can be expected not to report on these things as a journalist who loves my community and who cares about the actions of people who say they're advocating for us. I don't know how I can be expected to turn the other way, but my doing so doesn't make our community better. There's no version of me that believes that if I had turned my eyes away from these things that the black community would be doing better today. And the abuses of usually black cis men who are these untouchable leaders in our community who are allowed because they have an office to do whatever they want. It's not getting me free, Michael. I'm sorry, it's not. And a lot of people who have worked directly with FBC, who were employees of FBC, were informing my journalism. How do people think that I learned so much about this organization, if not from the very people who were working inside of it, many of whom were saying, yes, there are deep and serious problems here. How did I get all of that information if people other than myself were not also concerned? My job as a journalist is to have sources and to be able to demonstrate the things that I am saying. 
I have done that. It hasn't been any fun, but the truth in our community matters. People following up on the things that they say that they're going to do matter. And this is the last thing I'm gonna say, Michael. We're living in a moment where black radical activism is making a lot of people uncomfortable. And I wanna speak plainly. The FBC was created through the consultation of Justin Trudeau, Gerald Butts, Ahmed Hussein, and the Liberal Cabinet. Those individuals knew that there was an FBC before the public did. And they have been working hand in hand. That is not a group that is going to guarantee the freedom of safety of Black people. It is a group that secured some federal funding for itself and got very, very close to a lot of politicians. But then when a young man is facing deportation, well, now I have to think about my judgeship in my career. I respect that. I respect that. But maybe then don't put yourself in the front of the organization. Maybe don't be the one to go take meetings with the minister when you know you can't do that. Don't promise me and the people working with Abdul that you're going to do something for us and then put that information away and make sure that the rest of your group never sees it. You don't need to do all of those things. And John, Donald McLeod has chosen to do those things. And that's why he's facing this hearing. He's made a lot of this about me, but I didn't write the rules of the Ontario Judicial Council. So this is where we've come to. It's not a fun chapter for anybody in our community, but I, I have to stand by my work and by the reasons why I've decided to engage this issue the way that I have. I know that's a lot. Uh, I really respect that you've given me the space to say that. This is a really, <laughs> It's such an awful thing to have to deal with. And yet at the same time, I know why I have engaged in thinking about and writing about the Federation. Well, I appreciate your rawness, your, your honesty. Um, it's quite obvious that, you know, it pains all of us, including yourself uh, to, you know, be in this position to do your, your, your work as a journalist, to present the information that, that uh, you have. And as you mentioned, there's a hearing going on and it's up to people to look at all that is being said and weigh in in terms of their own thinking around it. I, I, but I really appreciate you bringing that here tonight. I appreciate the opportunity. So let's uh, turn, and go, turn it over to the audience. And I'll switch roles into a moderator. And uh, Jerisha is going to help me to um, garner information from the chat, uh, questions, uh, so that we could have you answer them. OK. Yes. Uh, thank you for that raw, authentic uh, discussion uh, and conversation. I think I often say that um, as Black people, we are human beings, uh, like every other human being with nuances and complexities. And so we are, we, we, none of us ex escape, right, the nuances that make us human. So, so thank you for be, being uh, authentic in that conversation. Thank you. We have a question, I think, here from Tina. Uh, she says, um, let's see here. I think that question, I'll read the end of the question. What, basically, what can we do as community and parents to support our children um, in terms of the school, the school board? Um, what can we do as parents to support and demand better for our children? I mean, it's a great question. It's a, it's a really big question. Uh, I think of all of the things that have been going on in uh, education recently, uh, the, the two places that I've been really drawing a lot of inspiration from that are local to us are Peel Region, of course, and also Hamilton. In both of these cities, um, people involved in the school system, including students, parents and community members, they have really taken their activism, I think, to a higher level. The organizing that I am seeing in Peel region right now around our schools, it, it's, 
I, I actually cannot describe it. Something has happened. Something has awoken in Peel region where people are fighting in a way that I have not seen since I lived in the GTA. Um, recently, I was able to do a, a workshop with a whole bunch of vice principals in Peel region who read my book. And uh, I was able to do that because, um, you know, a year ago, some people in the region read my book and started saying, let's create some study groups and let's create some reading circles to start talking about how this group or how this book may impact our work. And of course, there are stories about Peel region education system in the book. So it, I find, I think it was relevant for a lot of people. What I can say for the question is, I really encourage you in your organizing and in your struggling in your communities to try and reach out to people in Peel region and to try and reach out to people in Hamilton and to form connections and bonds with them. So, um, you know, there's a, there's a group uh, anti-racism in Peel schools. Uh, there is the um, defund Hamilton police service in Hamilton. These are groups that have extensive experience now working on campaigns around uh, school resource officers, um, campaigns around trustees in school who have been engaging in racist behavior because unfortunately in the province of Ontario, every board that you look where black people are in any number, it seems like there are trustees who are really just mistreating our kids, mistreating our black families in these regions. And I think we have to share knowledge. And so for those who are like, I, you know, I want to start, but I'm not sure where to start in my own community. And certainly, uh, you know, formerly a Vaughan African Canadian so Association, but now Anchor, these are groups that I recommend that you look to, if you haven't done a whole bunch of this organizing to learn, because there are people who have those experiences in your community who are local and who can, I think, share a lot of really useful local experience and knowledge. We are never stronger than when we have solidarity across, for example, geographical reasons or regions. So when Hamilton, Toronto, Peel, York, and Durham, the day that we all start connecting our campaigns and our efforts together, sharing resources with one another, we're going to be tremendously stronger than we are now. And as I had just mentioned, you don't have to start an organization if you don't want to in order to engage in this kind of work. A lot of really excellent work is going on among organizations, but a lot of it is also going on with just grassroots collectives, groups of small numbers of people in their communities who are getting together to try and take on a local issue. And I find that to be really effective. You know, the group that rallied around Charlene Grant and Vaughn, including VACA, was a very small but dedicated group of core people who got a lot of work done. And I think that that's an excellent model and, and can really work. And when people have organizations and institutional strength, we can join together and we can build band forces as long as we believe that we're fighting for the same things. So I would say, don't try to start on your own because there's already people in your community and in the region who are doing the same work. And, and, it's best to try and connect with them and to learn together. Thank you. So we'll jump to another question. We have a question from, um, from our mayor, John Taylor. Thank you for a fascinating discussion. I have a question. Can you describe what significant improvement in Canada or the GTA would look like from your perspective? 10 or 20 years from now? And what are some of the big things that need to occur in, or, in order to get there? Uh, so thank you to the mayor for this question. Um, I'm looking at major municipal areas, major urban areas, not just in Ontario, but across this country. And uh, what I'm seeing is a frightening increase in poverty and in those who are living most desperately day to day. The number of encampments in Toronto, 
in Edmonton, Calgary, Vancouver, Halifax, Montreal. It doesn't matter where you go in this country, if it's an urban center or an urban region, we are seeing levels of desperation that I haven't seen. You're seeing people camped out in our public spaces because they don't have affordable housing. And what I would say to the mayor, I really wanna see in the future is I don't wanna live in a region or in a municipality that spends more money on police than it does on education or housing or food because that is where our municipal budgets are going, period. There are municipalities in the greater Toronto area and beyond that are spending anywhere between 10 and 25% of their budget on the police. And those budgets are increasing. And I wanna know how many thousands of troops we need to have in our streets before someone tells us now you're safe. And if the definition of a safe society is how much money you spend on policing. Because if you look at our budgets, which are a measure of our priorities in these regions, we're telling everyone that our number one priority is policing. Now I'm going to say this, and I think that this is an important distinction. And when we talk about abolition, when we talk about defunding the police, people think that these are very extreme notions. Let me break it down in this way. Our number one priority should be safety. I believe that. I think we all believe that. We can't live without it. I do not formulate safety the way that my white settler colonial society tells me, which is that mostly white men with weapons and armor will run through the streets, will ride through the streets looking for trouble and finding it. And that will make for a safer society because they will know how to respond and keep everyone safe. I reject that model of safety. I believe, I know, that the police's job is to keep some people safe from other people. Their no job is not to have a universal notion of safety. And to wanna just repurpose that in 2021 and to pretend now that we can, we can just envision that that's what the police are gonna do one day. We can undo the centuries of history that have led us to this moment. We cannot do that. And we don't have to do that. The police don't have to be the hero of this story for it to end well. So I would say to the mayor, let's spend more money on housing, food. And I don't mean combined because you have to add like eight or nine budget items in a municipality together to get what the police get. The number one priority when people are sleeping out in camps in Canada in the winter should be housing. We should be spending more money to house people than we do to police them. And what we do is we have people in parks and Mr. Mayor, someone calls the police because they don't wanna see the sight of a poor person in the park. And that's your and my dollars not going to help anybody get out of poverty, but policing their poverty. I wanna stop policing social issues. I want real safety in the form of housing, food, good education, all the things that we know are good for people. So you just gotta flip around your municipal priorities and then you've gotta convince your regional partners to do the same thing and to stop believing in the mythology that men with guns are going to provide our safety. That is not the future. All right, so I think we have time for one more question. So we have a question regarding activism. Jody is asking, how might activist groups address white individual or groups who counter our activities or our activism and anti-racism and equity work with accusations of bullying and attacking? Well, I do know something about this topic. Um, I have never met a black person who stood up for themselves and avoided the label of bully. Every black person who really stands up for themselves and for other black people at some point in their life is going to be labeled as a bully. 
And I think what we have to do is we have to find reassurance in our readings because black people for generations, my, my comrade L. Jones always reminds me that our ancestors thought about all of these problems that we are also facing today. They've written about them. They've documented what they thought. They've argued with one another. We are very afraid of conflict in black spaces because we tell ourselves in Canada, there's only a few of us. Those, those who came before us were willing to argue and debate difficult issues and very contentious life and death things with each other out in the open in public where other people, including white people could see them. I am not with this 21st century, don't ever expose your differences to the white man thing. I'm sorry, we live in this country. If we wanna be like other people, we have to have the right to have different opinions and strengthen each other by challenging and debating and thinking through with one another. That is the way that we are gonna get better as black people. And so what I would say is we need to look to the writings and the thinking and the teaching of black people who have come before us and remember that when we face that, you know, gaslighting and those attacks from white people saying that um, we are bullying them, you know, one of the hilarious news pieces that I always remember was Margaret Wente in the Globe and Mail after the pride demonstration. She called uh, her piece, the bullies of Black Lives Matter Toronto. It's charming to live in a society where the police have a billion dollar budget and a group of black people with loud voices and placards can bully the billion dollar police state. That's charming, I like that idea, but it's not real. And we're going to encounter that as black people. We're going to have our confidence attempt to be undermined by people who are afraid of what we're doing. And we have to rely on one another and in the knowledge and the comfort and the care that we can provide each other as black people and in the history of writings that tell us that others before us, you know, had to struggle with these things too. It helps a little bit, I think, when you realize that you're not the first person who's gone through this. And, um, you know, the support of my own friends, my colleagues, my comrades, as I do this work, you know, people like Robin Maynard, Idil Abdullahi, my wonderful roommate, Huda Hassan, like other people, like, particularly black women, and I wanna echo what Michael had said earlier and shouting out the black women in my life. That's how I stay grounded. That's how I stay sane, is by talking with people, by commiserating with people, by venting sometimes if that's what needs to be done, but thinking through and dreaming and challenging with other black people as well. We need each other to reassure ourselves when forces come to us and try to destabilize us and make us feel kind of, make us feel doubt about our struggle. We really do know what our struggle is and we have to reinforce it, I think, with each other. Thank you. Thanks to everyone, we're, we're out of time. We didn't get to all the questions, but I uh, wanted to say thank you so much for- Oh, excuse me, I'm so sorry. I just wanna quickly add, I see that um, Lina Singh is in the chat um, and I just wanna acknowledge you and say good evening to you and uh, just proud of you for the struggle that you've been engaging in in uh, York region. I just wanted to get that in. Thank you. And uh, thank you to uh, everyone who did put something in the chat, question, comment, um, and thanks. So thank you, Michael, for leading this riveting discussion. Thank you, Desmond, for being authentic and real um, and, and going into all the different nuances and complexities of not just the society that we live in, but the body that we, we embody as Black people. And so thank you to the New Market Public Library as well. I'll, Rob, if you want to come on and see a few closing uh, remarks, thank you everyone for attending. I'll hand it over to Rob. Thank you so much to Naka as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Thank you.
That was great. Yeah, thanks, Desmond. And thanks, Michael and Teresa. Um, thank you also to everyone for attending. Uh, we hope you found this presentation informative and thought provoking. We'll go ahead and end the webinar now. Uh, thanks again, everyone. Bye.